Sphinx of the Merc, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, on the God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening to each of you. I am Demetrius Cox, a member of the Wilson branch of the NAACP. And I want to thank each of you for supporting this important event today. And I also would like to recognize each and every single person um, in these capacities. So I, may, I ask, uh, will you please stand if uh, one of your profession is um, being called. <clears throat> all ministers of the gospel, all elected officials, all veterans, all school personnel, working and retired, all members from other county branches of the NAACP, all members of the Wilson branch of the NAACP, our President Reverend Dr. Lamont Foster sends his regards. Um, and also too, we'd like to give a special thanks to Don, Don Blagro and Latoya Powell for being able to lend their expertise and skills with helping us to do these things, but also to putting this important information out there to the community. developed a strategic plan to build partnerships that support students', students success through community empowerment. In that time, this committee, our committee, has championed the calls for enlightening the public about the adverse effects of incarceration on families, children, and the whole community. We have also adopted a school and developed partnerships with the school district and numerous community programs to fulfill this goal. Data tells us that our families and our children are in crisis. COVID, anxiety, depression, incarcerated family members, homeless, homelessness, and hunger have plagued families and therefore our youth. Today, we're here to provide awareness through community and state advocates in order to move you to action. All around us are families, children, and individuals, maybe even some of you that are living with what is often a silent struggle. Our goal is to create an informed community of partners through disseminating information, connecting resources, and implementing strategies. It is our hope that you will join us in this effort to surround and protect our youth. Our motto is Stronger Unified, and it perfectly aligns with the mayor's concept of One Wilson. It does take a village. We ask you to be informed and to be a part of the solution. Thank you. video because we never want the community to forget that we are here to inform you of the impact of incarceration on all of us, the community, families, and children. Data shows that many times the underlying societal issues that plague our communities are the pathways that lead our youth to detention. Please watch as Jamie Foxx briefly shares his heart about the incarceration of his father. They put my father in jail for $25 worth of illegal substance. They put him in jail for seven years. This man was an educator in the hood, in the, in the inner cities, educating kids. The judge that he would have come to the school and talk to the kids presided over his case and 
put him in jail. And what they didn't understand was their father taught me everything. Taught me how to play football, uh, uh, basketball. Taught me how to play tennis. And I was like, why, why am I learning how to play tennis? He said, because I don't want you to be limited. So when they put him in jail, however, what, we, what do we do as a family? And I don't like visiting jail. I don't like that type of perception. So I, I said, I, I told my pops, I, I, I can't come see you because I see you as a king. But I wrote him, I wrote him a letter. I said, hey, you know, things have gotten good for me. When you get out, I'll save your life. And he's been living with me for 20 years now. Wow. Same house. So, I hope that in that short video, you could feel Jamie's pain, that you could feel his separation anxiety, the trauma, and even the fear, when he asked the question, what are we supposed to do as a family? I know that some of you have heard some of the data before, but I want to keep it before you. As you came in, there was a rotating slideshow of the data that has been collected from Wilson County. And from it, it shows that we have about 20% of our children that have moved in the last year. We have about 50% of them that are struggling with some form of anxiety or depression, among other things. The other thing I want to point out for you is that it says that children are traumatized, children that have someone that's incarcerated, are traumatized due to the lack of compassion and sympathy for their plight by adults. And I know that all of you have probably been in a setting somewhere and heard somebody say, oh, they're just a bad child, or you know they came from such and such a family, or you know their parent or someone is incarcerated. But what my parent did doesn't make me the same person. But what my parent did will mold me if somebody doesn't help me. And I want you to keep that in mind, okay? Um, the stressor of having an incarcerated parent is the same magnitude as abuse, domestic violence, and divorce. And these are all cases that have been research-based. Children with an incarcerated parent increased from approximately 2.7 million to over 5 million. And so we have been talking with the schools and saying to them, as you go to the table as a social worker, as a psychologist, as an MTSS professional, however, whatever your role is, please look a little, little further at why that person is acting out, failing, rebelling, whatever their issue may be. Look a little further. So we'll, we thank you for being here tonight. At this point, um, we're going to ask Mr. Ms. Terry Proctor, the Chief Court Counselor, and Mr. Mike Ralston. They are both with Juvenile Justice and Prevent Delinquency Prevention. They're going to share some data with you that they have around students, risk factors um, from their from their research. inviting us to be here tonight. And uh, yes, we're here with the Division of Juvenile Justice. My name is Mike Walston. I now work with the Community Program Section. That started about six months ago. I have about 27 years of experience with Juvenile Court Services. And I'm going to introduce Ms. Terry Proctor. And my name is Terry Proctor, and I'm the Chief Court Counselor, and I've um, been with, started in 1996 when I was graduating. title and we are relieved to hear that because we 
that's part of as we're talking about the JCPC programs and what we're doing. We're trying to prevent um, the children from getting further and deeper into the system, and we're trying to prevent them from being in detention or in a youth development center and keeping the programs in the communities. Um, when you think juvenile justice, the mission is to strengthen families and increase public safety. And our vision is to provide effective services to youth and families at the right time at the most appropriate setting. There are five sections of juvenile justice. You have your facility operations, clinical services, educational services, and you have court services, which is Ms. Terry Parker, and community programs, which is uh, myself. Okay. Is there a... Oh, we're cooking with gas now. So when you talk about community programs, our department gives $28 million to JCPC, our Juvenile Crime Prevention Councils. Every county has one. Wilson County has a Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. They are allotted $293,000 or $293,000, and those, those funds go to look at at-risk uh, programming for youth and also for the programming for delinquent youth as well. Uh, general statute indicates who can be part of the council. Again, it's open to the public, the sheriffs involved, our county managers, our judges, um, our, our stakeholders in our community, they're involved in that. And they look at at-risk factors, they review needs, prioritize um, risk and needs data, they look at funds for treatment and rehabilitation. And again, so we really look at trying to focus on those programs that will really serve our at-risk and delinquent youth. And uh, every year they do an RFP process where programs can apply for funding. And uh, our RFP process just ended, but local public agencies, 501c3 nonprofits, and local housing authorities can apply for funding. So again, David Moody is our current JCPC chair. He's waving his hand. He's back there. He's the chair for our JCPC council. And uh, so again, it's usually the, it is the third Friday of every month at 8.30. Again, it's open to the public, and again, the focus is what can we do to look at the needs of youth in our community, especially in Wilson County, as it relates to at-risk and delinquent youth. It's a lot on this slide, but uh, it's just kind of a nutshell of some of the programs that our department is doing. Uh, we have funds for intensive intervention. That's funds for your high-risk needs youth. We have multi-purpose group homes that are secure, that provide secure residential, residential care. Uh, have full-time counselor staff. We have transitional homes for homes that have youth that are coming out of facilities that are preparing them back into the community. We have Ecker Camp, wilderness camps for youth that um, want to uh, work on family counseling and want to, um, they're 13, 17 year olds. And uh, that's a 90 day placement for youth. We have crisis and assessment centers. Um, that they look at um, stabilizing youth, youth's behaviors and care. 
um, and they make sure they're in a stable place before they go back into community. So again, when you think of community programs, we do do our JCPC programs, but we also have programs, again, that's more on a state contract basis, but also we have the residential piece as well. Parker's talking about low numbers. So this is just a, uh, kind of a trend data of our school-based percentages. So if you look at all the complaints that come in, again, we're talking juvenile complaints. We're not talking adult complaints. And uh, we're looking at a span, okay, and, and I know Latoya's will probably touch on raise the age a little bit. But it, there are some districts that, are, in terms of school-based complaints, they're like at 80%. So you're thinking of all the complaints that are coming from law enforcement, private citizens coming in, 21% come from the schools, and this is fiscal year 2016 to 2017, uh, excuse me, 2017 to 2018, around 32%, 2018 to 2019 is around another 31%. Again, these are not perfect numbers by any means, but we are lower than the state averages in terms of school-based complaints. But then you see a dramatic drop. So why do you think there was a drop? COVID. COVID. This is exactly right. And so you know, so so we're we're not perfect in this, and there's a lot of work to be done. But you can see where the numbers completely fell apart. But as you know, kids are now coming back to school. They've been out for two years. Now they're coming back to a structured setting. You know what's going to happen with these numbers across the state, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I did want you guys to kind of see the offense percentages again. Uh, so as you're looking at school-based complaints. If Mike Walston goes out there and I decide I'm going to damage 10 cars, I'm going to break into 10 cars, it's going to be one, com one juvenile and it's going to be 10 complaints. Okay? So as you're looking at, are you looking at this data here? So you're looking at school based juveniles charged again. So 2016, 2017, we had 40 youth with 64 complaints, 42 with 69 again the fiscal year. Again, we're talking fiscal year, we're talking July, July 1st through June 30th. 2018, 2019 fiscal year had 33 uh, juveniles with a total of 55 complaints. 2019, we had 20 juveniles with 24 complaints. And then you see 2021, we had two juveniles with six complaints. These are examples of things that can happen in schools. And you guys, you hear about this stuff, you see it on the news. There is, okay, I have been with the juvenile justice system for 27, going on 28 years, very blessed. There was a time, some of you guys know, we had zero tolerance in the school system. If they charge every, every youth that gets in a fight and goes through the juvenile court system, we do not have the manpower to cover all of that. And our law enforcement does not do that. So if you hear anything from me tonight, understand that not every fight is being charged with a juvenile complaint, because you saw the data that shows that it's not. 
But there are times that we do deal with some of these situations. But uh, most of the times when it comes to, I'm sorry, most of the times when it comes to fighting, we probably won't even see these offenses. Because a lot of this will be referred to team court. Sheriff's Department's going to do a good job and make sure that they refer to those cases. They don't even come to juvenile court. They refer to team court. They refer to mediation. They refer to services before they come to us. We want to appear. You bring a gun to school, there's a good chance that was going to come to court services. But let's say this youth this looks like this is a gun here, maybe it's a BB gun because he was being bullied at school, there's a good chance that might not even come to us. So I just want you guys to kind of see every situation is different. Um, don't necessarily take things at face value, but again, we got to make sure that we're educating the community, our law enforcement officers, that we're working in partnership and make sure they know what programs to refer to because we're not in a place in the juvenile justice system where we can take every offense that occurred in school, and we don't want that. So, what if school-based offenses are occurring? And again, this is the current fiscal year. So, majority of the cases that we have, we have 17 simple assaults, 12 disorderly conducts at school, eight disorderly conduct by fighting, six assault with a government official, it could be with a teacher, possession of a weapon other than a firearm was five. So in a nutshell, what you're seeing again, most of these offenses are misdemeanor offenses that are occurring this current school year. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Where does bullying come in on that charge? That would be, that could be communicating a threat. Uh, Isn't it also underreported though? Again, this is only what's coming through our department where there's been a complaint that's been filed. It's so not saying, sir, that that doesn't happen in schools, but this is what, where criminal charges have been filed for a juvenile. So we're, again, we're not talking to adults, we're talking to juveniles. Great question, though. Yeah, Q&A at the end. Give it a B, can you get in the red? Okay. Okay, we're gonna talk about a little bit more about the intake process. Every, every child that comes into contact with us has to start out in the intake process. And that may be, like I said, it could be in on this one, it could be the delinquent. Um, the delinquent for just for terminology would be this similar to a criminal offense only as a delinquent juvenile we still we're not trying to do punishment it's not about trying to remove somebody from the home the our process is all about treatment so we try to address and we we part of us is public safety but part of that is also to provide the the, the best service for the child and the family at the right time um, Next. Okay. In our intake process, um, we have, we, you're looking at the ability of the family to access their own resources. Every charge that comes to us from law enforcement or from the, somebody in the community, it does not mean because it crosses our desk that it's automatically going to go to court. We have a, um, a strong diversion rate trying to keep kids out of court and trying to serve them and, and other services in the programs that we're talking about without actually having to go into the court system. So a large population that we're dealing with never even see the inside of the courtroom because we're trying to provide the services that they need outside of court. And they're very similar to what they would get inside of court. We just try to head it off and try to do it at the beginning. Um, but we, we do look at protection of the community and you're considering the victim. The victims are always notified, if there's a victim in the case, the victim is always notified of what our decision is when we notify the parent, we notify the complainant, which is the person who is asking for the charges, and we also notify the victims. So that has been a big push over the past couple of years to make sure that the victims are notified and that they their voices are heard as well. Um, we do a lot of assessments, and they are evidence-based assessments. When a child comes into our office, intake used to be 30, 45 minutes. Now it's probably an hour to an hour and a half because we're going to do these evidence-based assessments if it's a criminal gang assessment or a Yazi assessment, we're determining their risk and their needs and what we need to put in place for that child. It's not just coming through and saying, okay, well, you're going to court, this is where you're going, this is what's happening. It's what service can you and your family benefit from? What services can your parent get you to? Or do we need to assist you with transportation to get you to these services? So it's all, it's not just a cut and dry, yes, you've been charged, you're going to court. Um, our decision 
we can close a, a case if we feel like we have a family that comes through and the parent is active and they are trying to access their resources on their own and we can assist them but we think the parent is going to follow through with that then we can close out those cases and we don't even have to put the services in place if we feel like you have we have a parent who's going to be able to do that we may give them numbers maybe to the local mental health system and maybe to a provider because we're trying to put those services in place but sometimes we do have parents that can access those services without our assistance they might just need the phone number or a connection to them uh, we do have the diversion plans and contracts which is what i was talking about instead of going to court we may divert outside of court and you can still do community service you can do some of our mental health programs or some of our jcpc programs um, a lot of what we're doing is trying to bring everybody around the table and have child and family team meetings and make sure that we're addressing everything that needs to be addressed to keep the children from going all the way into the court system. Um, they, some do get approved for court. We do have some that maybe the, the diversion plan or contract was not successful, so they end up going into court and they're the ones that, that go before the, our judges and um, have are placed on probation or if it's undisciplined placed on protective supervision but that's again it's not just to say let's see you know what you can get further into the system if you don't cooperate with this but sometimes the plans and contracts don't work and so we do have to go to court and make it a little bit more a little bit more contact that we have to that we need to be making with the family with the child with following up with the school the providers whoever is involved in that case um, we throughout this entire process we're going to refer to whatever services we can put in place for that child whether it's inside of the court or outside of the court we're, it's all about services and treatment so I was talking previously about school-based offenses and so far this year we've had 54 youth in Wilson County that have been charged with some type of offense understand this could be if one child committed three different acts, that could be that would be considered three different juveniles. So you could have multiple youth included in the, the number of 54. Okay. What's telling you about this, and I think it's one, it's not a perfect number. We don't want any youth being charged. But of all the Wilson youth that we've had so far this fiscal year, we had 54. 16 were approved for court, 15 were closed. That means there was either no further action or they were closed with some type of service or resource. 19 were diverted from court, which Ms. Potter was talking about. So instead of Johnny going to court, we were trying to put some services in place for Johnny, whether it be mental health counseling, therapy, some other type of maybe mediation, some other community type of service. So instead of them going to court, they can cooperate with that diversion plan. If they do what they're supposed to do, then it doesn't go to court. And then we have five decisions pending. So if you look at the 54 youth that were charged through the school system, about 69% did not even come to court. They were either closed and or diverted. So our diversion rate, this is just, again, this is a snapshot of what it looks like this year, but I did want you guys to kind of see in terms of the numbers, and we knew the numbers would go up because youth were coming back after COVID. They were going to kind of go up, but I did want you guys to kind of see what was going on with that. Now, Unfortunately, the 54 youth that we're talking about, 80% of them are African American males. And one thing with our department, we take this very seriously, and we look at racial ethnic disparities, red, and red exists if, in this, if a specific minority group rate or contact a point in the juvenile justice system is different than the rate of Hispanic youth or other minority groups. So we want to look at the intake process and making sure we're making good decisions on, on all, the, all the things Ms. Potter was talking about. As you're getting a, a kid in the, that's coming, coming in front of you, you wanna make sure you're making decisions, prior involvement, um, capability of access and resources, um, how they're doing at school, how they're doing at home, you take in all those variables, you're just not making a decision based on the race of the child. We do cultural competency uh, training, increasing alternatives to detention, that was a big push by our department because it's two in the morning and if we have a youth that we need to um, detain, we want to make sure, one, we're doing all the assessments. We're doing our risk assessments. We're doing our criminal gang assessment. 
we we'll make sure we're doing all the assessments properly and making a good decision in the middle of the night because if we can avoid a youth going to detention, then why don't we put the kid on alternative to detention to try to get services in place? So we try to look at how can we uh, increase um, those alternative detention numbers, collaboration with stakeholders and uh, decision points. If Sheriff Wood has been dealing with the kid for several hours and they bring him to Mike Walson's desk and say, you know, Sheriff Wood, this kid doesn't have any prior involvement, but they do have an offense that's detainable, then I want him to feel comfortable knowing that Mike Walson's staff is going to provide X service and we're going to keep the community safe and we're going to try to get services in place for that child. And so they feel comfortable with what we're doing. And again, we're trying to provide a service to the family and keep the um, community protected at the same time as well. And so that's why we need to make sure we're having collaboration with our stakeholders. And I just got the two minute sign and that is, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> juvenile minority sensitivity training. One thing I'm gonna work with uh, Dr. White with our juvenile crime prevention council is doing a, uh, a red training and kind of dig deep into the numbers. And that's something that we're gonna probably look at doing in the spring for Wilson County. Again, Local programming, if, if the youth is having a problem with, a, uh, if, excuse me, if a parent's having trouble with a child, they can come to the court counselor's office, we can try to get services in place. Again, if we can prevent a youth from going into the court system, we're going to try to do everything we can to do that. That's why we do consultations. Uh, we give a parent a piece of paper uh, to say, these are the services you can refer to, please follow up. So when they come back, we can see if they've done that. These are just some of the services that we refer to locally. Uh, as I talked about, Wilson County, uh, our JCPC funded programs. We have teen court, mediation, parenting wisely is a parenting uh, skills program, transition reentry that works with youth when they're coming out of the facility, 30 days while they're in the facility, and it's in 90 days when we come out. It a, has a vocational piece, family preservation piece. We have community service and restitution. We have therapeutic foster care. And any questions? I know this is a lot. Um, we were going to hold the questions to the end okay. so that our um, next presenter could. Okay, all right, thank you. But thank you, very thorough. Yes, Good evening and thank you all for coming out. My name is Attorney Dawn Blagrove. I'm the Executive Director of Emancipate NC and a proud partner with the Wilson NAACP. And um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Attorney Latoya Powell. Attorney Powell is a, is a Deputy General Counsel at the North Carolina Department of Public Safety where she primarily provides in-house legal services and counsel to the Division of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Programs. Prior to joining DPS, she served as Assistant Legal Counsel in the Office of General Counsel at the North Carolina Administrative Office of the Courts, where she advised judicial officers, excuse me, judicial officials and their staff primarily on juvenile delinquency matters. She is also former assistant professor of public law and government at the UNC School of Government, where her research and teaching focused on juvenile justice issues. Prior to becoming a law professor, Powell was an assistant attorney general in the appellate section of the North Carolina Department of, Ju of Justice and a juvenile prosecutor in the Johnston County District Attorney's Office. She is an active member of the North Carolina Bar Association and is a current co-chair of the Minorities in the Profession Committee and former chair of the Juvenile Justice and Children's Rights Section. 
was named Powell as the 2020 Child Champion. She is also an adjunct professor of law at Campbell University School of Law. Powell is a graduate of, UNC, of excuse me, North Carolina State University at UNC Chapel Hill School of Law and is admitted to the North Carolina State Bar and the United States Supreme Bar Court Bar. She lives in Cary with her husband and son and enjoys running marathons, lots of marathons, <laughs> as a hobby. Um, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Attorney Powell. And so 
because of this, we know they need help. We need to show them a little bit of grace and provide second chances when they make a mistake. <clears throat> and that's what we should be doing when they get into trouble, get into minor scuffles at school, make decisions that are violations of school rules, but that also might technically violate the law, right? Because of all that stuff we talked about that we know about youth, we expect them to sometimes get into a fight at school or maybe disrespect a teacher. Maybe they get frustrated and throw a pencil across the classroom. But a lot of these kids are already at risk for court involvement because of the circumstances that they're living in. A lot of these kids are coming to school every day with trauma because they live in a home that has food insecurity. They live in a home that has substance abuse, mental health, domestic violence. One of the parents might be incarcerated. We've heard a lot about that tonight. So think about a child coming to school carrying all that trauma and then knowing everything else we know about the, the, the teenage brain and how they're less able to regulate their behavior and, and respond in a rational way, we know that they might do something that will get them in trouble. And we should be responding with age-appropriate, community-based, and school-based responses that will effectively address the behavior. But oftentimes, what happens is this minor misbehavior is criminalized because we respond to it by arresting and filing the charge in the juvenile court system or the criminal system. And that is what fuels the school to prison pipeline. Now again, um, you heard some data from Mr. Walston and Ms. Proctor. You guys are doing much better than some of our other counties across the state. Traditionally, school-based referrals in North Carolina make up somewhere between 40 to 50% of all juvenile court referrals statewide. Your numbers are much lower than that, and that's a wonderful thing. But when kids get sent to court for that fight, or that disorderly conduct, or that injury to property, whatever minor uh, misbehavior it was, it creates a much greater likelihood that they are going to reoffend. And because of the trauma, and it is traumatic to have a child be arrested at school. Just imagine eight, being eight, nine, or 10 years old. You get into a fight at school, and then in front of all your peers, your teacher, your friends, you get handcuffed and walked, escorted down the hall, maybe placed into a patrol car, taken downtown. Some of these kids are placed in secure custody. We heard about secure custody a few minutes ago. Think about how traumatic that experience is. Then they get a court date. These kids are, you know, they, they can't even really regulate their behavior at school. Then they have to go to court and face a judge. And that might be traumatic for them. As wonderful as our juvenile court judges are, we know that they're well trained and they're doing the best they can to minimize that trauma. But it is a traumatic experience. And then they have to go back to school faced with the stigma of having been arrested and charged and, and labeled a juvenile delinquent. It's a traumatic experience. And so that interaction with the court system creates a much higher likelihood that that child will ultimately end up in prison as an adult. And that is what we refer to as the school to prison pipeline. So we try our best, um, as Ms. Proctor was saying, to, on the front end, prevent the child from ever getting into the system, because we don't want them there. That's, it, it's not a good thing for them to be in the system. And the other part about the pipeline is that we know who it, who it impacts. It primarily impacts children of color, children with disabilities, the poor, the LGBTQ community, and other groups who are more often suspended, expelled, and arrested than their peers. And that is just something that the data has confirmed over and over. And then, I just talked about this, but when kids get into the court system, 
remember they got into that fight at school or did something else that, that got them in trouble, they probably had a school consequence as well that they've completed, they're back in school, but the court case takes a while. I mean, it might be 30 to 60 days or even sometimes longer than that before the court case is resolved. They might miss a lot of class time because they have, have had to go to court multiple times, they've had to meet with their court counselor, they've had to engage in whatever uh, services or programs that the, that the court has ordered. And some of these kids are already at risk of academic failure. So what we know from our data is that court involvement increases the likelihood that children will fail a grade, that they will ultimately increase the likelihood of them dropping out of school, increases the likelihood that they will reoffend, so higher recidivism rate when kids go into the court system versus when they are referred to community-based resources, um, all sorts of things. They have barriers to higher education. They might not be eligible for that college scholarship. They might not be eligible to join the military. There could be immigration consequences, all sorts of things that we place on these kids that will burden them for the rest of their life, potentially. And so one way that we have tried to address this in North Carolina is through a major policy change in 2019 called Raise the Age. I'm sure everybody in here has heard about Raise the Age. Really great piece of legislation that finally brought North Carolina um, that basically uh, brought North Carolina to um, do something that most states had already done many years ago, and that was to increase the maximum age of juvenile court jurisdiction. So for over 100 years in our juvenile court system, the upper age limit was 16. So if you were a child and you get charged at school for this school-based offense, if you're 16 or 17, before raised the age, you were considered an adult. And that case went to criminal court and you potentially, um, if you were convicted, that would create a permanent criminal record that would follow that youth for the rest of their, life, um, of, of their lives. And so raise the age was really um, impactful because it moved most of those 16 and 17 year olds to the juvenile court system, which is more rehabilitative, which is for the most part confidential and doesn't have the same collateral consequences as a permanent criminal conviction. So because the law, it does require that for 16 and 17 year olds who commit more serious offenses, they still are treated as adults. But guess what, that's a very, very small percentage of the kid, of the 16 and 17 year olds who get in trouble with the law. Over 90% of those kids were committing misdemeanors. They're all in the juvenile court system now. So we've done really well there with thousands of kids now who don't have a permanent criminal record because of race to age. But that's not all. As I've been talking about, it's also not good to put kids in the juvenile court system. It's better than the criminal court system, but again, it's not perfect. It's still traumatic. And so another thing that the race to age law did is it authorized a program called the School Justice Partnership. And that is a program that is, does exactly what it says. This is a picture of the School Justice Partnership team from Wayne County. A School Justice Partnership is exactly that. It's a partnership between community stakeholders, folks just like you all in this room tonight. Law enforcement, schools, courts, juvenile justice, all the stakeholders who have an interest, who have a stake in school discipline come together and decide as a community that we want to help students succeed by keeping them in school and out of court. And so the School Justice Partnership is designed to create strategies to reduce school-based referrals to court through, again, a collaborative team uh, coming together and developing what is called a memorandum of understanding. The way it works, um, according to the law, the way the law was written and raised the age, the chief district court judge is designated as the convener. But it doesn't have to be the chief district court judge. It could be a juvenile court judge or whoever that person designates to convene the group. And that just means bringing everybody to the table. That's all convening means. Reaching out to the sheriff, to the superintendent, the chairman of the school board, uh, the chief court counselor, whoever needs to be at the table, reaching out to those people and saying, hey, 
let's come together and talk about how we can reduce some of these school-based defenses. And that starts the conversation. And the goal is, again, to develop an MOU that clearly defines the role of law enforcement and school officials in responding to school-based misconduct and focuses on diverting kids from the court system using a graduated response model. And that just means instead of immediately arresting and charging, we're going to try some of these in-school and community-based responses first before we jump to the court system. And so some of the things that our, our school justice partnerships are doing across the state are encouraging more parental contact. Call the parents, have a parent-teacher conference. I mean, how often do we do that these days? Refer to school support staff. If there's a school social worker, a counselor, um, a behavior specialist. If you have restorative justice programs, I think um, either Mike or Terry mentioned teen court. Every North Carolina county has a teen court program. And guess what? You don't have to have a juvenile petition to be referred to juvenile court. The school can make that referral without asking the SRO to charge that kid. Some of our counties have a juvenile mediation program. And I heard you know, some things about other programs that you guys have uh, going on here in Wilson County. So there are ways that we can address the misbehavior appropriately and through evidence-based resources without creating that trauma and burden of a court record. And so that's what the School Justice Partnership is designed to do. Um, this is a toolkit that I helped develop when I was at the Administrative Office of the Courts. It is available online at the AOC's website. And it has lots of tools and resources and a step-by-step -step guide that walks the community stakeholders through the process of developing the School Justice Partnership. Um, so that is available if that's something that the stakeholders here are interested in considering. And again, I know you guys are doing wonderful and I, I appreciate that even without the School Justice Partnership, the law enforcement, courts, and juvenile justice are working together already to keep those referrals low. But as Mike said, it's not perfect, right? We, we can do better. So this is a map that shows where school justice partnerships are right now. The blue shaded counties have an existing partnership. The gray shaded counties are in the planning stages, but they haven't yet signed their MOU. And then all the white counties are where we don't have any um, planning efforts going on as of now. And so obviously uh, Wilson County, you don't have a, a school justice partnership, and that's fine. But if it's something that you think you might be interested in, now you know how to find the resources to get the, the conversation started. And you know what it's all about. And so the goal is to have implementation in all 100 counties throughout the state of North Carolina. And this is a bipartisan effort. The last three chief justices of the North Carolina Supreme Court have all publicly said they support full implementation of school justice partnership in North Carolina. It started with our former Chief Justice Mark Martin. He retired and we had Chief Justice Sherry Beasley and now we have Chief Justice Paul Newton. All three of them have given a directive for counties to do this. And so that's the goal and that's what we hope to see eventually um, to help again reduce the school based referral. Really quickly, this is why you might want to do it. We see that counties that have a school justice partnership have been successful in reducing school-based referrals. As Mike said earlier, we have counties who have over 80% of their juvenile justice complaints coming from schools. You guys don't have that issue, but there are some counties um, who have significantly higher numbers of kids coming into court from school-based offenses. Um, and because of the decline in school-based offenses in these counties, we've seen a decline in the racial and ethnic disparities. Obviously, if most of the kids who are getting sent to court from school are children of color, when those numbers go down, less children of color going into the court system. Um, New Hanover County is an example I like to talk about a lot because they're the first county to establish a school justice partnership in North Carolina. They've had one since 2015. Since the uh, school justice partnership was implemented, 
they've seen a 67% reduction in school-based offenses, almost 70% decline. They've seen graduation rates go up. And this is the number that I like to talk about because SROs are still in the schools. They're still intervening in school discipline as they should. They're there for school safety, right? They have a part in this process, but they have more tools in their arsenal because of the school justice partnership. So before the school justice partnership was implemented, 86% of kids who were being referred to a school resource officer would be in charge. After the school justice partnership, only 24% of kids who were referred to a school resource officer were charged. So just think about that impact on how it changed the thinking of all the stakeholders involved that we don't have to charge these kids. There are other things that we can do to more effectively address the behavior. So that's what you know. one of the biggest benefits of the program is. Even if you already have low numbers, it really changes you know, how we think about school discipline, that we can do better. And another uh, great impact that it had in, in New Hanover County, some of you all might know that New Hanover County has a significant opioid addiction problem, like one of the highest in the country. And because they had the school justice partnership that included all the county officials, the court system, schools, social services, they already had a group that was regularly meeting and collaborating. That same group was able to work together to tackle another important social problem plaguing their community. So these relationships are really important because you got other things to think about, right, than our school to prison pipeline issue. And so this is um, the website for the Administrative Office of the Courts where you can go and find out more information about the School Justice Partnership. Again, lots of resources there. They also have a, an email address that you can contact uh, for support as well. So again, um, not sure you know, what uh, will happen here in Wilson County, but again, I'm just really excited to see all of the wonderful things you're already doing. And when I heard um, Ms. Carroll talk about this um, initiative that you have to really address the impact of incarceration on kids and to try to implement more restorative programs. I just, you know, I really applaud that. And I, you know, hope that more counties will take that initiative as well. I'm, I'm at DPS again, I'm in the Office of General Counsel. And so um, I'm Mike and Terry's lawyer, actually, because I, <laughs> I am the lawyer for the juvenile justice system in North Carolina. I didn't include my contact information on here, but if anybody ever has a question about juvenile justice policy, law, reform, or just wants more information about school justice partnerships and other uh, resources, please feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm always happy to help. And very, very happy again to come to Wilson for the first time ever, even though I'm from Johnston County. I don't know how, <laughs> I've never been here, but beautiful <laughs> campus, so glad that I finally made it. Thank you. Our own Sheriff Wood, if he would um, address us in relation to those low numbers and how he's managing to oversee all of that. Savior, and definitely thank you so much, Dr. White, for allowing me to be here today. I'm a very proud person whenever you know, we talk about low numbers as far as our juveniles. When I first came in to share, this one thing that I wanted was a, like a uh, truancy officer, somebody from the old days that would go knock on those doors and talk to those parents and try to make some things happen. Well, a lot of people said it couldn't happen and it wouldn't happen, but we were able to do that. But also, not only that, ladies and gentlemen, I think your men and women are just as good as your, their leader allows them to be. I love training. And I'm sure that our school resource officers receive training and not only go to conferences where they can receive that training and then sit back and just take it easy, but bring certificates back showing that they received that training and they were involved. But I will say, ladies and gentlemen, I remember those days when my mother, who was a teacher assistant, used to come home and and she used some of her methods, I guess, that they use in school where they bend your ear. And, um, 
give you that look to make you get scared, throw sweaty palms and threaten to uh, make you go stand in a corner and things of that nature. But you can't do all that now. Paddling used to be the way of doing things. When you saw a law enforcement officer, that was just to come out there and arrest somebody. But now these days, those same law enforcement officers are walking the halls of the schools. We, as they stated, we backed up a little bit to the five yard line and punished and saw that arresting was not going to fix our problems in the schools, but it's going to take one training, intervention, collaboration with our educational partners. And one thing we want to do is evaluate the totality of the circumstances of whether, you know, it's going to either be criminal behavior or some disciplinary infractions. And so we stood back and said, you know what? The school needs to take their own part and take care of these infractions. The days of a law enforcement officer, whenever a child just acts up and you go in there, you arrest them in the classroom and bring them downtown, it didn't work no more. So what I instructed my men and women to do, and I know that even went further, and I'll give you some numbers from my record management system, which will show you that it did work, was if they had drugs in the school, a fight, that caused serious injury, not just a fight of simple afraid, but caused serious injury or weapons violation, and I'm talking about bringing guns, threatening to shoot up the school, and we have had some of those, whether it be BB guns and or real guns, as well as knives, then they must uh, arrest for or obtain a juvenile petition. But this is where it gets great, ladies and gentlemen. It's not a good situation, but it gets great. And my Numbers, just like similar to what Mr. Mike said, indicated, maybe a little bit awesome, but this is pulled from our record management system, and it doesn't go along with the school calendar, it goes along with the actual year. But I pulled over five years. In 2017, the Wills County Sheriff's Office, and this is just the SROs within our three high schools and our seven middle schools, took over 199 reports in 2017. And that's a lot of reports. But it was based on everything from, uh, you know, whether it be a school issue or a wreck outside by students. But they took over 199 reports of crimes. I'm sorry, back of crimes. Four juvenile petitions were taken out. In 2018, 158. Six juvenile petitions were taken. 2019, 115 reports, five juvenile petitions were taken. 2020, because of COVID, of course, 35 reports, four juvenile petitions were taken. And then, of course, in uh, 2021, so far, there was 22 reports with 26, nine petitions were taken, and that was just basically there was a big old fight where some kids were seriously hurt as well as some guns were brought to the school. But I'm just telling you that all, ladies and gentlemen, to show you that it's not about going out there and arresting these young men and women because you don't know what kind of homes they come from. But it is happening to people within the community, the programs within the communities, and, and I applaud Deputy Wilson Police Department because they have over 50 programs of the police athletic league where they get involved, mentor the kids, make these kids understand about good moral citizenship, education, and just knowing that law enforcement are your friends. As well as where the schools allowed us to go inside and teach our great program, being a DARE officer myself, gain resistance education and training, where we also talk to the kids about good moral character, doing your work, respecting your teachers. So that old cliche of whenever a child walk past a law enforcement officer and that parent and I'm going to say bad parent because a good parent wouldn't say this. Lock him up. Well, I'm going to have you lock him up. Their child look at them and say, no, I'm going to have him lock you up. <laughs> and all that comes from working together, ladies and gentlemen, and not just thinking, as indicated before, that all kids are bad apples. If, if all kids are bad apples, in that case, all of us were some bad apples. But we grew up to be good people within our community, and we just need to give these kids the same chance. All my SROs, as I indicated before, and I'll finish some with this, receive extensive training. Not only with the state mandate, but crisis intervention training, because every kid that goes into their schools may have a situation that they have to deal with at home, and not something where the officer, the child may confront them, 
And all they can do is just say, well, I don't know what to do. But every single one of them, matter of fact, everyone in the whole entire sheriff's office, including those who answer the telephones at crisis intervention training. Also, juvenile minority sensitivity training. That is instilled in my SROs. As well as um, de-escalation training. And de-escalation training is the way to go these days, ladies and gentlemen. And you've seen the news. You've seen what goes around, around the world. But all of this training is what helps mold that SRO into being one of your best officers. Now, I can always go, always go back to one SRO who's a legend within Wilson County, Johnny Coleman. And Johnny Coleman, ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Coleman was the SRO that you just don't mess with. And I'm not saying don't mess with, <laughs> I'm not saying don't mess with him where he would hurt you, but the one that had the, the knowledge and the education, the workmanship, the love for the kids to ensure that whenever a child come by, he can tell that child, you need to make sure your work is done. Pull them pants up. Quit doing this. Quit doing that. That child will go home to their parents and say, Johnny said this to me and the parents said, well, you know what? You needed it. But that's what we started modeling ourselves after. Not just this officer who walks through the school, who walks and wears a badge and wears a gun and, and thinks that they run things. You let the school handle their issues and we're there just for backup only if what's being done is right. I'm glad that when we talk about the memorandum of understanding, we do have one. And the school understands that Wilson County Sheriff's Office, they work under the pleasure of the sheriff. The school don't tell them what to do. The sheriff makes sure they do their job. So whenever anything happens out of the ordinary, I'm the one that's going to have to take the consequences. So with that being said, I'm the one to ensure that they receive the training that they possibly need. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we have three high schools, seven middle schools, and 14 elementary schools. And not, that's not counting our early college. Each and every one of those schools, whether it's the middle or the high where there's an SRO, even the elementary schools, we ensure that there's a deputy every single day that goes into that school with a positive message. We want to show you that we want to be here for you. And I end, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about those parents who try so hard and make those mistakes and wind up as a resident in the Wilson County Detention Center. I thank God that we have a program that was implemented where they can get their GED so once they get out of that detention center, they don't have to worry about recidivism and coming back into that program or coming back into that facility for a bad mistake again. They have the, the necessary tools, and thank God the Wilson Community College that worked with us to make sure that this program works. But they have the necessary tools where they can go back out into this community and do wonders for their family. Again, thank you, Dr. White, for this opportunity. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And let's keep working hard to ensure that our young men and women have the same avenues and goals that we have in life as well, regardless of whatever walls come in between them. May God bless you and thank you all. to find community members and those that surround us that represent that, just that, women of history. So for Captain Chelsea 
Saunders. Jesse was the first female captain to command the Wilson Police Department's Special Operations Unit. She's very, a very active member of the Wilson Police Department's Police Athletic League. She holds the leadership position of treasurer with the Police Athletic League. She's a leader and advisor of the Wilson Police Department Police Athletic League Mentorship Program. And she's certified by the North Carolina Training and Standards as a physical training instructor. Is that the right? Instructor. So we would like to thank Captain Chelsea Sanders for all of her work in law enforcement in the Wilson community. Major Kendra Howell. Major Howell was the first female member of the Wilson Police Department's Special Response Team. She's the first female member to hold every rank within police, the police department other than chief. She's the first female to command our crisis negotiation team. The Wilson Police Department accreditation manager for several years. She represents the Wilson Police Department each year in the Law Enforcement United Bike Ride from Raleigh to the Law Enforcement Memorial in Washington, D.C. I applaud you for that one. <laughs> yes. So, Major Kendra Howell, the NAACP of Wilson awards you this in recognition of your valuable contributions to Wilson County law enforcement. And we thank you. to recognize we also want to recognize attorney Don Blayro <laughs> attorney Blayro is the CEO of Emancipate NC I don't know if you all watch the news but if you watch the news on WRAL you've probably seen her voicing very strongly and supporting uh, in social justice. So for Attorney Blayro is also one of the partners, our partners in the grant that we have on mass incarceration. And we thank her very much for all of the advice that she gives us, working with our district attorney here in the Wilson area, um, and guiding us to say, is this legal? Can we do that? Did you help us do that? Yeah. And so we really appreciate you so much for all that you do in North Carolina and all that you do in the area of social justice. For Attorney Powell. Attorney Powell. And you have heard Don give the accolades of all of the things that Attorney Powell has and continues to do. And so we want to thank her for all of her work and contributions to social justice. Thank you so much. And Elizabeth Simpson, Attorney Elizabeth Simpson, who's, who's another partner in the grant with us, who oversees the Community Alliance for Public Education, could not be with us tonight because her she had uh, her daughter was ill, and so yes, I said you know you stay home with your mommy, and so for her contributions to social justice, Dawn has agreed to take her certificate with her to make sure she gets that. Those members of the uh, education committee, if you would come forth, please, if you are here with the education committee. 
We have one or two that could not be here tonight because they're obligated in other areas. They serve on other committees. But if you would, please at least come and take a picture. We have um, Mr. Bobby Tyson, Mr. Charles Cook, Ms. Nancy Hawley, and I did see Mr. Demetrius Cox earlier. Is he here? If you all would please come and get a picture with, a really quick picture with them. Um, and I want to take the time while they're coming to stand with them. I want to take the time to say thank you so very much to this committee. This is a hard working committee. They are so committed. And no one knows the hours that really go into even just an event like this. And we do many of them throughout the year. So far, we've done about seven on mass incarceration alone. And that doesn't include the work we do as a part of, because we've adopted a school and some other things that we've done for children in the community. So I really appreciate all they do. Thank you all. Oh, and I want, and, and we, did, we did receive the award this year from the city of Wilson for the Community Spirit Award for this committee's work. So thank you. Thank you. 